Hi, everyone. Uh, did we test? Uh, hi, Rafael. Thank you for joining us. Did we test the audio chat already? Oh, uh, Hello, Kelly. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure being here. Oh, well, your audio sounds great. Thank you so much for being here. I know it's really hectic. Um, uh, Shirley told me I asked some of them to present, and she was telling me about the situation. So uh, thank you for being here. If you want to test your video, your webcam, just uh, really fast, what we usually do is just have it for like the first two minutes. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> and then after that, we'll take it off because we um, there's a lot of people who actually have um, bad uh, bandwidth. So. <laughs> All right. So I should have my video off then. Um, yes, and then when I, I call you on, then uh, when I introduce you, we'll have it on. And then um, if you could take it off again um, after the bio, like after I read your bio and stuff. All right. Um, and your slides, so I can show you those really fast because um, um, we don't, the system doesn't support uh, PDF. So what we do is. Um, so I put it, I made them into JPEG. Yeah, that's what we'll do. We did that in the first one, and then um, they, they'll, we use a polling tool is what um, Peggy was saying. Um, you get, some people are doing it on a mobile device, and they can't, the system, okay. actually a lot of people have been doing it with a mobile device. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm I'm not really sure I know how to use this polling tool, but then if you could uh, help me with that. Uh, don't worry, we'll do everything for you. <laughs> You're great. All you have to do is um you can oh let me tell you about how the this works as far as the um the slides go. So in the top, do you see under the timer? Um, it it yeah. has a right arrow, um, yes. and then that's just how you do it. Okay. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna um have to go through a few slides first. Okay. Uh, so let me go uh tweet this for the last two minutes and I'll be right back. <laughs> All right. See you soon. Well, um, we do we just hi everyone. Um, we're gonna begin in just a second. Um, so we're.
really, really excited to have Rafael here, Fidenti, from Brazil. And we're going to start the recording in just a bit. Um, but before we start the recording, um, Recording started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Reform Symposium Conference, online, totally free. And um, we are focusing on the future of education. And we are really excited because what we wanted to do this year was we wanted to um, get uh, kind of experts in education and in technology from all over the world, but are also doing really great things with it. So uh, we wanted this conference to be a lot more than just uh, talking about technology. We wanted um, to see the ways in which uh, technology is really transforming the world. Um, so we have um, from uh, Brazil, Rafael Penente today. Um, and we're really excited to have him. I'm going to tell you more about him. But first, I want to thank our sponsors why we're able to have this for free. <laughs> um, and thanks to Steve Hargadon, uh, Future of Education. Um, and then um, these are our other sponsors. <laughs> Um, to make it a little bit more interactive, we want to know where you are in the world. So what uh, we have done is we have put up this map and uh, we are giving you whiteboard tools. And so what we what you do is you just click on the little orange star and then just click where you are from. So we'll give you some time to do that. Um, and then while you're doing that, I'm gonna have um, I'm gonna have Rafael come up and um, play this video while I uh, tell you about uh, the incredible keynote that you have today. <laughs> so he's gonna show his uh, video for just a sec. <laughs> so Hello everyone. It's a big pleasure being here with you today, tonight, in Rio. <laughs> Uh, let me tell you about Rafael. Um, he is the Under Secretary of Education for the Municipality of Rio de uh, Janeiro in Brazil. And I was really fortunate to be able to um, meet with him and have um, actually have a proper meal with him uh, in Rio when I was there last year. And he is absolutely amazing. I don't even know how he does everything that he does. Uh, he's very passionate and forward thinking. Uh, he's one of the reasons why uh, Brazil right now, um, it, especially Rio, has um, this emergence of wonderful technology. He's going to tell you about all the wonderful um, things that he has instituted. But on top of that, um, he has a master's in educational leadership from Pace University. Um, he's fluent in Portuguese, Spanish, English. He has a, a PhD in international education development at NYU. Um, he is also the leader of the Brazilian group at the Global Education Leaders Program. He was a coordinator and researcher um, at Institute of Estudo. Um, assistant Professor of the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at NYU, Co-Director of the Annual Conference of International Education at NYU, and so many other things. Uh, but I also know that he has a great passion for, uh, for having those um, uh, children um, and, and many of the kids in the schools that don't have access to technology, that they're actually really... The kind of uh, Ministry of Education for the City we take care of education from 0 to 14. So we call it basic education. It's, it's before high school. It's uh, starting with uh, child care centers and uh, we, we call uh, some the schools that uh, take care of children from 0 to 6. We call them for childhood development. In uh, Portuguese, it's the Espaço de Desenvolvimento Infantil, EDGES. Uh, and we also take care of uh, schools from first grade to ninth grade, from uh,
children are six to when children are about 14 or 15. Yes, uh, Maria is asking if uh, school is compulsory in Brazil. School is compulsory from uh, now it's from four years old to 17 years old. But um, although it, it is compulsory, uh, not uh, you know this this law is not really put into effect. Not many places have 100 percent of uh, children who are between four and six, for example, in school. Here in Rio, we have 80 percent of children who are between four and six in school, and it's already a lot. Uh, from six to 14, there are about 98 percent of children in school. Uh, and meaning all the kids, the ones who live in the slums and the favelas and, and everywhere else. And uh, we're starting a new project now to go after these 2% who are not uh, in schools and are very um, uh, complicated cases because, you know, they're, they're either uh, they have problems with drugs or they live on the streets or uh, they have um, some kind of special needs. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, there's another question. For, Peggy is asking if there are consequences for the kids who don't come to school or for their parents. Um, not really. Uh, I would be lying if I said that uh, there are because you know we can we can go and try to convince parents to uh, have their children put in schools, but uh, uh, yeah, they don't learn. But uh, that's it. Uh, there's no uh, punishment in terms of uh, government or legal punishment for kids or for their parents. Rafael, um, should we maybe like have them just watch about the first three minutes, and then um, they they can uh, come back and um, you can just kind of talk about the video. Okay, so we'll give you all, uh, another minute for those of you who are just uh, straggling in um, to watch this video, and then you can come back in. Okay, so then uh, um, hopefully you got a gist of what was going on, <laughs> and uh, um, we'll have uh, Rafael talk okay. more. <laughs> so um, what we did first here in, in Rio was to uh, establish what uh, we expected children to learn uh, every two months uh, in every given uh, knowledge area. Because um, it, it was quite confusing uh, before. There was no clear curriculum, and uh, it was um, a, a little bit hard for teachers and, and, and students to understand uh, what they were supposed to, to teach and learn. So first off, we uh, established a, a clear curriculum guidelines, curricular guidelines for everybody. And after that, we started creating um, things that would help teachers and students to, to teach and learn. Like national standards, yes, but uh, we're talking about the city, so we do not yet have national standards. Um, yeah, this this has been a discussion if we need a common core or not in Brazil. Uh, I personally think that we should uh, have at least a basic uh, minimum um, of um, you know knowledge that uh, every Brazilian uh, should have, and uh, and and then each place and each school um, could. Um, um, Personalize or customize the, the 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 rest of the curriculum, and yes, we have a central uh, ministry of education that sets up uh, guidelines that uh, cities and states need to follow. So there are laws and legislations that uh, everyone needs to to um, needs to follow, 
And then what we did was we created a platform of uh, digital lessons. So everything that the students need to learn is on this platform. Uh, meaning when they go online and it's an open platform, so if you type um, if you type www.educopedia.com.br, that's the, the teachers from our own system to be the curators and the organizers of uh, these digital lessons. So if a teacher had to build a lesson on, on the French Revolution, for instance, then first he would go out there on the web and try to find the best resources he, he or she possibly could on the French Revolution. And plus, we also had um, hired private companies to uh, develop some um, some objects for us, some uh, activities like uh, games. Uh, and we also created um, um, a kind of a methodology that is based on uh, metacognition and the, the discoveries of uh, neuroscience. So for each of the digital classes, uh, you have kind of similar types of activities. First, you have to review uh, what you learned in the previous class, and then you're introduced to the new theme, and then we explain why this new theme is uh, important, and we try to give concrete examples from real life whenever it's possible. Uh, we say what we expect the, the, the children, the students, to be able to do after they finish the, the lesson. And we start uh, with a very superficial um, exposition of facts and, uh, and information. And from the beginning to the ending of the class, uh, the activities, they have to be organized and curated in such a way that if I see a video at the beginning of the class, then the video uh, needs, it's probably going to be very superficial. But if I play a game at the end of this digital lesson, then the game is probably be going to be very challenging. So in every digital lesson, we start from very superficial knowledge to very deep knowledge uh, at the end. And uh, that, you know, the last activities are always very challenging. We do not expect all the students to be able to go through uh, all the activities in the digital lessons. Also, uh, there are some quizzes in between different uh, activities of uh, the digital lessons. So uh, the students themselves can try to answer the questions, and they're going to be testing themselves and checking if they are, are really developing the kind of knowledge that uh, we ex expect them to. So um, you know, uh, the students, they can access this platform from anywhere, from a connected computer. We know that 80% of our kids in Rio de Janeiro, they have computers already at home and 71% 70, of them have connected computers. So it's, a, it's already a very large proportion of uh, our students uh, having computers at home and we think we need to, to use that uh, in regular education, but we need also to be able to tell students that they, they can also uh, be self-learners. They can go online, and they can go to this platform and they can learn by themselves if they were absent from class or if they need to review something uh, they can go online and, and, and learn. Um, another thing is, after we created the digital lessons, we started a new part in the platform that is called Educoteca, and we took some books that were already in the public domain uh, from Brazilian writers and from international uh, writers, like uh, uh, 20,000, in English, but it's 20,000 uh, submarine something. Uh, I forgot the name, but that are testing machine, and it's actually a place where the students can uh, be tested and test themselves and their knowledge. So what, what we're willing to do is to have uh, uh, students testing uh, migrate from papers to computer-based uh, testing. Uh, and uh, we're, we're pushing it to the limits in uh, Gente, that is this new, yes, that's it, Clarissa helped me, it's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, that's right, one of the, the books that we published, uh, thank you, Clarissa, that we published. Uh, yeah, everything that is published, Benjamin asked if the books are published under Creative Commons, everything in uh, um, that is, is published and created in, within the platform, within Educopedia, is uh, published uh, with the Creative Commons uh, 
by. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, people can use it as they wish. Yeah, that's that's a slide of uh, Educopedia. It's a it's um the the first uh, the top part of the slide is showing the first page, and we uh, we change that all the time. So if it's Christmas or if it's uh, Mother's Day or if it's the beginning of the academic year, uh, we have a different cover. Uh, no, I can I can move the slides. Thank you, Steve. Let me see here. The rest is uh, is for Jane. Um, and uh, we so we're we're uh, we're also piloting testing students um, in uh, this platform. And uh, the the students for each of the skills that they learn, they have to answer six questions: two easy questions, two average uh, difficulty uh, questions, and two very hard questions. And uh, you know, if they answer the first four, uh, they already go to the next skill. They can. Already, uh, we consider that they have mastered uh, this skill, but um, of course, we push our students to to answer all the six questions. If they get one of the questions uh, wrong, then they they do not. Uh, well, actually, we give them another chance. But if they get uh, two uh, questions wrong, then they have to stop, and they can only begin again uh, after some, you know, after 24 hours. Um, let me see. We uh, from the first to the third grade, when students are learning to uh, read and write and the basic uh, skills and concepts of uh, math, uh, we created something called Pejivento, which in English translates to whirlwind, and it's actually the name of a, a game. It, it's a mashup. It's a mixture of a, 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 a course with a game and with a with a, a book, a virtual book, because there's a story, and uh, the kids, they every beginning of uh, every class, they, they see a video and animation, like a, a, a cartoon. Um, and uh, after watching this cartoon, they play games. And with the games, they um, have to listen to the, the, uh, the narrator, and they have to understand concepts so that they can play the games and uh, and uh, the games are kind of a, a test uh, that they need to to do. And uh, after we created the the Ducopedia, the platform and everything that we put inside, we went uh, forward and we decided to think of a new model of school where students sit together. They we call it a family. It's a table that uh, yeah, gente also means people uh, or folks in Portuguese. That's right. Um, so when when kids go to school, they sit to get well. First, when they arrive in the, the in this school, they go through a diagnostic uh, evaluation test, so that we understand if he or she actually knows everything that he or she uh, was supposed to know. So in math, for example, you're not going to learn quadratic uh, equations if you didn't learn fractions or if you didn't master. Uh, Multiplying numbers. So we try to find this cognitive holes uh, that stayed in the past, and we thank you, Bruno. Uh, and we kind of create a map of skills and abilities that show the teacher and students all the skills in math that the student has already developed, and all the skills in math that the student has not developed. That's the, what we we call the, the the skills map. So it's very clear for students and teachers. Uh, instead of only getting grades and receiving grades, they understand what it is that they know, what it is that they don't know, and um, you know uh, what they were supposed to know but they don't know yet. And from this map of skills, we create a kind of uh, an itinerary path. So every week, uh, every student needs to learn different things because they know different things. So, for example, this week, uh, I, I know that in history, I need to learn about the Second World War in math, I need to learn about I don't know the the, the theory of um, I don't know any kind of theory. I have different things, and I sit together with five other students, and we go through uh, different activities to learn that. But there are suggestions in in this uh, itinerary path that we call. They see suggestions with uh, with uh, tools that are online or printed. Um, 
the, the, the website is in Portuguese, uh, Valeria. Uh, so they have suggestions of things. If I need to learn about the, the World War II, then there are suggestions like the, the digital lesson in Edukopedia, but there's also a video on YouTube, and there's, you know, other things that are printed and that are books and everything. Um, so, you know, the student knows what he is expected to learn every week, but he gets to decide which activities he's going to do in order to learn that, in order to develop that skill. And he also decides, he or she also decides uh, what time he or she is going to be tested on the development of that skill. So, you know, uh, I've read a lot on the Second World War, I've uh, watched videos and so on and so forth, and now I think I'm ready to be tested. So I click on a button saying, you know, I want to be tested, and there's a, a mentor teacher, we call it a mentor teacher, because it's not a specialist anymore, you know. It's a, it's a teacher who's always with me throughout the week, and uh, he is going to teach me what's most, most important, which is I need to know how to learn by myself. That's the main goal of the teacher, you know, to know me, to sit by my side and to learn with me and to teach me how to learn better, to make me understand what my learning uh, style is. Uh, so it's not this uh, later on. Uh, Shelly just, um, just published the, the link to the YouTube video. So if you can stop now and take a look. The, the first three minutes of the video and then come back. And when you come back, if you could just let us know you watched the first three. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that, but um, if you go above and you'll see the main room, uh, just click the, the arrow box and you can click the green yes. Should, should I go on? 
Yes, let's go ahead and go on now. Okay. So um, someone said that uh, students also need to learn uh, how to socialize, interact, need a, a network to support them emotionally and, uh, you know, in everything they do throughout their lives. So, uh, yeah, show empathy and so, so on and so forth. So this is the second thing that we really uh, change in this school. There are lots of different activities to develop these other dimensions of, uh, you know, the human being sense of belonging, that's right. And the third one is what we call transdisciplinary projects. There are activities that uh, they're going to develop uh, with, their, with their teams. Uh, so uh, they have a family of six students that they belong to, and three families make up a team of 18 students. And each team has to decide at the beginning of every six months, they need to go out, out of school and they need to talk to people in their communities to try to find a way that they're going to apply the knowledge that they're building in school in order to solve or try to solve a problem that they see in the community. So, uh, you know, they've uh, developed things to try to, um, you know, uh, not solve but uh, help the community with uh, problems with garbage, for example, or teen pregnancy or drugs. Um, what else? Uh, uh, violent parents. There are many different things that uh, they brought to school that uh, they decided to, you know, the students and their mentoring teachers decide what it is that uh, the, 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 the theme of the project is going to be. So after they decide the theme of the project, they have to, uh, in real life and in their communities and yes, uh, purposeful learning, that's it. And uh, they, you know, they can be they can be actors of, of change and they can improve the place where they are. And another thing that we find that is very important, uh, very important in this uh, transdisciplinary project is the process of transformation of the student because then they can also see that uh, their immediate reality is not necessarily the reality that they're going to be in for the rest of their life, that uh, uh, you know, students can change uh, the, the, the reality where they live in they can dream, they can be ambitious, and they can uh, transform uh, what's not so good into improve uh, whatever is out there. Uh, results so far have been uh, mixed. Uh, we have had uh, students who were very, at the beginning, they, they, they had a lot of problems because uh, we, you know, our, our metaphor that we use is uh, we always treated like uh, students like birds in a cage and suddenly they, you know, we just opened the cage and we said, okay, now you can fly. And they were not ready to fly. So even good students at the beginning, they said, look, um, I, I'm, I don't feel I'm learning. I need teachers to tell me what to do. I need, uh, you know, I need someone to test me. I need, um, you know, the, the, the students, they were really uh, used to being uh, Oh, can you hear me alright? I just want to check my audio. Sorry? I, I heard someone else now. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah, can everybody hear me? Can you just um, guide me through um, what I'm supposed to do? I'm not sure which room, which session it is from 10 to 11. Okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hearing someone can else. I just I'm not sure. Um, yes. This, this, uh, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's a different uh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not really sure either. Let me go ahead and take the microphone off for folks. <laughs> What's that? Okay. Now I think. Okay. Um, so, where was I? Okay, so uh, as I said, the students have, the, you know, some students, uh, they, they were, they, it was not easy for students to understand that uh, we, uh, yeah, regular classroom, that's it, uh, that we wanted them to be more autonomous and for them to be the, the center of learning and for them to control their own life grade. So next year he's going to a, a state school, to a state high school, and he asked us to, that he he wanted to repeat the grade so that he wouldn't leave school because he was sure that he would learn much more if he continued being in Genshi than if he went to uh, just a, a normal, regular kind of school again 
you know, so he was kind of uh, desperate, and uh, it really broke my heart to to hear him saying that. Um, and uh, you know, teachers, all of them are kind of very surprised to the level of autonomy that uh, the students have developed from the beginning of the year uh, to now, and they are very pleased with uh, how much learning has uh, happened um, in in the school and within their their networks. Um, I think I'm uh, so you know if you see these slides, there are some uh, there are there are some explanations in English and in uh, in Spanish, and I think you can probably have this file uh, and read some more about uh, Gente. And uh, you know it's also important to say that uh, it, it's a public-private partnership. So there there were foundations and institutes and private companies that. Um, Paid for this pilot, and that we're very, um, you know, we're very pleased with uh, the support of uh, these partners. Um, I guess that's it. I think um, I think I'm ready for questions now. Okay, good, because uh, a lot of people wanted to ask you questions. Okay. Uh, so um, the way this works is um, if you could. Raise your hand, and then if you already had a question you put in the box, um, you could repeat it. Then I would really, um, that would really help me out because um, <laughs> it, it's hard to navigate these questions sometimes. Uh, so I, okay, so Clarissa, did you want to ask them through the audio or do you want to go? Actually, I'll just go ahead and ask them to save time. Sorry about that. Okay, so. Um, we'll start. Benjamin says, are studies being conducted to compare learning outcomes using the platform? And then we'll go to close that. Yeah. Uh, there are many evaluations going on right now. There are process evaluations and impact evaluations that uh, we actually are going to need more time. But um, it seems like, you know, we're actually going to have a lot of um, good results and the, the impact in learning. Uh, it, it's very, uh, you know, it's very clear right now that uh, most students are learning much more, are le learning at 1.5 uh, uh, what other students in regular schools uh, learn. So this is, you know, superficially, and right now we we tend to see these results, but the results are not ready yet. So whenever, you know, when I I have these results ready, I'm, I'm you know, I'm they are probably going to be published in Portuguese and uh, probably in, in English and and Spanish as well. Clarissa asked if I was inspired in any way by Salvador da Ponte and uh, José Pacheco. Yes, uh, uh, we, as I said, we visited... I'm not sure if you heard me then, but I was hoping, Mariana, that you could put... I'm, put I'm, I'm hearing someone else again. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry about that. I thought I disabled these. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, yes, we visited uh, different schools, and uh, Pacheco is a very good friend of ours. He has been in, in Genshi. He launched uh, his latest book in Genshi. He's, been, he's talked to students and teachers there. And uh, um, are there other questions? Um, Benjamin you, asks, how is service learning evaluated through multiple choice? No, actually there are like service learning and uh, other uh, more subjects like the, the projects, they are all uh, evaluated with a kind of a 360 degree um, evaluation. So there, there is a self-evaluation, there is peer evaluation, evaluation by uh, the, the mentoring teachers, and uh, then they get to the, the result of their evaluation. Uh, Francis asked if this program is going to be rolled out to other schools. So we're probably going to have five other schools next year uh, with this same model, but we're also testing uh, tools and things that we've uh, established for this school in other 68 schools. So we're rolling out not only the, the, the complete model, but also uh, some things that we created and we're piloting in the school to other to other schools. That's great. That's great. Uh, Clarissa said that uh, you know people are planning to have something like change in other places. I've you know we've been talking to people in other cities and states in Brazil, and uh, 
you know, it's it, it's great. I think we need to really, you know, experiment and change because we know that the the school model that is out there, it, it just doesn't work. It's not interesting for kids or students or teachers. You know, teachers get frustrated because students are not interested anymore. And, you know, now when you go to Zhenxi and, and see the kind of interaction and the kind of relationship that uh, happens between students and, and teachers, it's, it's I think it's very obvious that um, we need to, to change. We need to experiment. You know this project will be in any school from Rio de Janeiro. Um, I'm not sure I got this, but it, this this project is in a school in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, it's actually going to five other schools in uh, in Rio. Exception, uh, yeah. Uh, another great question by Clarissa is that, you know, the, we need to adapt. So technology changes, you know, people change, societies change. So schools, they need to be living organisms too. You know, we need to understand that we need to reflect as educators and as, you know, uh, people who have to transform and form other people that uh, we need to adapt and we need to uh, Evolve. I hope teachers network and share their experience with this project. Yes, uh, the teachers, um, Benjamin, they stay at school for eight hours every day, but every day they have two hours uh, free. You know, they have two hours to, to plan and to network and to um, grade and uh, do professional development and all that. Um, any other questions? Uh, and you know, uh, everybody's invited to come to Rio and come see uh, Zhenxi. And you know, uh, I'm very grateful for this uh, experience. Recording stopped. Thank you so much. Um, we do have the recording. It is going to be um, it's going to be available right away. Actually, as soon as um, we all um, leave the room, so I'm going to go ahead and give you the recording link. And then also right now, there's there's a lot of different um, teachers speaking as well. Uh, we have something on iPad apps, and I'll uh, copy and paste all of those in the chat box as well. Um, I put the Twitter, but just in case, um, I'll put that Twitter again. There you go. And um, the, the, he blogs as well. Now, it's in Portuguese, but my um, I found that my browser automatically translates. So I'm able to understand a lot of the great things that are being done. Um, there as well. So um, be sure to follow that. Um, you can find all the recordings. Let's see, where did I put the recordings? Oh, here we go. So let me go ahead and give you that. And then I'll give you the links to the other sessions too. So we have mentoring, uh, iPad, um, app, and there you go. See you on the next session. Thank you, Shelley. It was great.